Sam Terry has been deselected uh, as a candidate for Labour in Ilford South, and it all seems above board. According to that, it's just he lost by 499 to 361. Now, uh, that's not really the case, so it's not quite as straightforward as that, is it? Steve Walker from uh, Scorebox is is with us to talk about the uh, deselection of Sam Terry. Now, this started off with the trigger triggering the deselection, didn't it? What what happened with that process? Um, well, there were severe concerns raised about the process of the uh, the trigger meetings that were going on. And uh, David Evans, the party general secretary, actually acknowledged that there had been people, you know, impersonating others and things like that in the uh, in the ballot meetings, and then said, "But it's irrelevant to the results, so we'll just let it stand and just plow ahead anyway." So you know, the knives were out for Sam Perry, for whom I have no particular torch to carry. I mean, I'm not a massive fan of his. He's you know, he's more or less on the left of the party, and you know, that's about as far as I'd put it. Probably, however, there is a principle in, involved that. You know, I mean, the left wanted uh, automatic reselection process in the, uh, you know, in the Corbyn days. But, you know, no, I don't think anybody on the left would have said that it should be a stitched up process that's that's rigged and that the party should ignore all kinds of, uh, of wrongdoing that it didn't even dispute was taking place. Um, and that, you know, so that was that was bad. But it, it mirrors what we've seen across the country. I mean, we saw bullying and intimidation. Uh, we've seen people... Uh, admitting that they, you know, votes were cast in their name when they weren't there and all this kind of thing, uh, in the case of Absalda Begum and others. Um, so essentially, if the party decides it wants rid of you, it's going to do everything it can by hook or crook to uh, to get rid of you. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, the actual trigger to, for that was, you know, not many MPs have had their trigger process uh, to, to be deselected or whatever, reselected. Uh, what happened after that? I mean, T Sam tried to um, challenge it, didn't he? But what what did they say when he when he he challenged the, the whole thing? Well, that thing was the thing. You would expect them to just dismiss. You know, if they're going to they're go ahead with the meeting with the trigger process anyway, you'd expect them to just dismiss his complaint to tell. Oh, we don't believe that was happening. But they actually admitted it. I mean, David Adams replied, I think to Sam directly was that, uh, oh yeah, we we you know we we accept that there have been some. Some of these things happening in the meetings, but we don't believe it's been relevant to the results, so we're just going to go ahead anyway. Which is, you know, the, again, go back to the Absana Begum case. You know, she was uh, badly ill, had a sick note signed off by a doctor, had her domestic violence advocate saying that the party was committing domestic abuse against her um, and extending the domestic abuse that she said she'd suffered from her husband. Um, and their, their, their response to that was like the old Windsor Davies, was it? They called the Bodhi House, had never mind. And, and they just did the same in this case. They went, yeah, well, there's been some fraud, but, you know, uh, we'll plow on. And, you know, they were just determined they were going to do it. So they went ahead and did it anyway. And then, and then, on, the, and then on the night, um, you, you, printed a you published a story about the, the actual uh, vote uh, that took place. What, what, what happened there? Well, that was that was very odd because, you know, I mean, the, the right, if you remember John McDonnell saying they're really bad at, uh, <laughs> it wasn't the word he used, but really bad at, at organising these kind of coups. There were some, I think, you know, over 900 people entitled to vote involved, 300 plus at the meeting and another 600 postal votes came in. Uh, the postal votes appeared quite late on in the last minute. Um, a number of Sam Terry supporters were barred from entering the, uh, the ballot meeting on the excuse that their subs weren't up to date, even though they said they were. Um, how the party can tell who's up to date and who isn't, I don't know, because they still haven't got proper control of their systems after the big data hack from last year. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so these, these 600 postal votes turned up uh, clearly from the numbers, which were, I think it was for 499 uh, to 361 or something like that. Um, out of those, you know, the, the tens and ones the wrong way around. Uh, but it added up to 860 votes. So there was still probably some 50 to 100 votes missing from the tally of people who should have been uh, counted in the, in the ballots and presumably didn't go there in order to abstain uh, and therefore should have been in that number. So, you know, the, the, the postal votes appear to have been decisive. Um, 
I'm told that Sam Terry's supporters had the majority in the actual meeting uh, in person, but the, these postal votes turned up and, and swung it. So, uh, yeah, that in itself needs considerable examination, really, if you were going to have any confidence in the process. Uh, and then, of course, it was only downhill from there, so you wouldn't think you could get much further through the bottom of the barrel, but they managed it. So, so that, that, I mean, that 600 postal votes, it's, it's like something you'd expect from what we, we talk about Latin American sort of... Uh, you know, like or South American, you know, really for I mean, it's just I'm not saying any words like F begin with F, but I just feel that um, it's fantastic. That's a word of F. Um, just I'm just uh, so it's it's bizarre that they they think that that's acceptable um, to to do that. But um, yeah, well, I mean, I don't know how many exactly members that, that there are in Ilford South, but are you typical CLP? Uh, 600 is, is around a thousand so you're talking about 60 percent of the members all suddenly you know voting by postal vote and and the other and another 30 percent turnout yeah 90 percent turnout in a in a meeting would be unheard of even in a in a selection meeting really so you know it, it just raises a, a lot of questions um, well look, I've, I've just i've just noticed we've got uh we've got one of our our, our labor heroes is on the is on the call um diana nesman you're 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 in Ilford South, so how yes. did you see that? How did you see that? Hi, well, <clears throat> I'll tell you some of the things that happened. I went out canvassing with a friend um, who is a member of one of the communities, and he said that he would go to houses which were supposed to be of members, and there'd be ten, and there'd be. Uh, renters there who'd never heard of the members. Um, we, we found a lot of these so-called members in places where there weren't any members. That was one thing. Um, at the actual really odd, I don't know if you know, we were told there were going to be four people. And when people were asked to do their postal votes, only three were, were there. That was Atwell, Terry, and another woman. Um, and they were asked, some people were asked to put things in order, to put numbers in order, you know, in terms of uh, uh, when they were voting. At the actual hustings, which started terribly late, uh, and uh, uh, I noticed at one stage, Sam went into the toilet and the regional person had the door open and looked in the toilet while Sam was there. It was very strange. Then we were told that, um, that it was lots were taken as to who would be first. So, of course, Jazz Atwell was second. Um, and then we were asked, they were asked questions. Now, our officers are all of the right in our particular constituency. The question, I sent in questions that asked about policies, about ideas and so on. Every single question, first question was asked, are you going to unite behind Keir Starber? <laughs> I.e., are you going to be a nodding dog? Uh, and then the three other or four other questions were all about the local authority, how, you know, to say how wonderful it was, to say how good it was that, the, that they'd got all these, and to say what were the issues in the local authority. Now, we're not asking for an MP to be uh, a local councillor, we're asking for an MP to be somebody to represent the council. The, constituency but also to have something more to say well those were clearly i mean it was like a coronation it was written pat ball for atwell to answer in spite of that and his and his fans all stood up and cheered whenever he came on in oh. spite of that um that's what happened at the meeting we are in so many times in our constituency we have found that all sorts of people turn up at the last minute to vote 
for the right. People we never see in branch meetings or anything else. Suddenly mm -hmm. they turn up, there they are. And the same thing when we had the trigger ballot, they all said the same thing. We want accountability for our, we, we want to have a choice. We want accountability. Why can't we have a choice? Um, and one other thing, uh, Atwell made a big point of saying that he had he should have stood the last time, but uh, it hurt him so much that he he didn't stand. But he was found, you know, he was a you know, he was found innocent of whatever it was. Um, we we are not, you know, there are a lot of questions around what happens in Ilford South. A lot of questions. And the same thing in Ilford North with Wedge Streeting. But um, my feeling is that, uh, I, I mean, I'm very angry. A lot of us are very angry. Somebody who's been a member of the party for over 50 years is talking about leaving the party. And other people are talking about leaving the party because they're so disgusted with what happened. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming on, Diana. I mean, you look, you look a bit shaken by by that. It must have been quite. Um, I mean, I, those kind of selection meetings were a, a nightmare. But in that circumstance, it must have been horrible. It thank was you. awful. It was awful. Yes. Thank, thank you for coming on uh, and and sharing that. Um, now, Steve, the, the, there's only one other uh, uh, issue, which is what um, Diana was was in, uh, talking about there, which is that Labour ignored her harassment advisor to dismiss complaint against Atwell. This is something he published on Scorebox. Um, the, the right wing Redbridge council leader who ousted Terry as new parliamentary candidate was the subject of serious sexual harass harassment allegations and was reinstated by Starmer Run party against the recommendation of uh, independent legal advisor. Um, can you can you tell us any more about that without getting into trouble? Yeah, uh, well, yes, I think so. I mean, the, the, interestingly, the, uh, the actual legal advisor's documents went into the public domain on the same evening, which I hadn't been aware of until after I published it, which was, which was interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, so this barrister, which was employed by the party to advise on this case, because the allegations were very, very serious. I won't go into details about what those were. Um, they um, they brought a barrister in on this, and there were, you know, there was claim and counterclaim. There were there were very serious allegations from this, I believe, a, a counselor, a former counselor, who uh, you know, was making the allegations against Councillor Athwell. And uh, you know, then there's what, what looks to me at least like a smear campaign then going on against the uh, complainant to try to undermine his credibility. Um, so the legal advisor said these kind of things are not uncommon um, in this kind of case, and it can often be a question of, you know, this one said this and that one said that. It is impossible to judge this case based on the written submissions, you, you know, the, the essentially telling the NEC, you must get the people in to talk to you in person so you can better assess who's telling the truth. And uh, the party ignored that, decided that there hadn't been sufficient evidence uh, submitted and dismissed the charges. Uh, and this was a right dominated uh, panel mm. of the um, NEC members, etc. So, you know, the Athwal and West Street and others immediately went out and claimed that they'd been exonerated by the party, but the detail of that now shows that, that they, this wasn't the case. It was, you know, the case was simply allowed to evaporate because they ignored the, uh, the legal advisor's recommendations to take this thing right to the end of the process and, and do it properly. So um, the guy, the candidate, that's well, this guy, he could be really put under pressure in, in an election on this, these allegations and, and, and Labour's opening <coughs> itself up for attack, there, aren't they? It, it, yeah, I mean, it could, it could well be. Um, and the, the situation as well is that, um, you know, obviously they've got a big majority in Ilford, so they don't need to necessarily worry about what the result there is going to be, but it's going to be uh, meat for the grinder for the Tory party generally in the general election to, uh, you know, to put this out about Labour sleeves and Labour covering up for, you know, potential sexual harassment and so on and so on, especially when you've also got cases like uh, the two former staff member women who were... Um, 
you know, have, have gone on the record that they were asked by the party and refused, I gather, uh, to sign non-disclosure agreements to cover up sexual harassment by, uh, uh, or alleged at least, um, sexual harassment by a male staff member toward them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it's not a one-off. This appears to be a cultural thing within the, the right wing of the Labour Party. And, uh, you know, we're talking about, well, it's Keir Starmer's era when these things were happening. So um, it's, you know, he, he's the leader, so he's got to take ultimate responsibility for this. But the people under him are, um, you know, appear to be from, from what can be gleaned from the evidence available. Um, you know, essentially just turn the blind eye to anything that right wingers do while mm -hmm. finding any excuse they can to go after the left. And it's yeah. reminiscent of the case recently that we saw with a, a certain Mr. Stanger. Um, who, well, apparently, I mean, I, I've seen that Mr. Stanger might have been on the on the Zoom, but it, it, it did appear in the waiting room. I'm not sure. Oh, okay, he, that's interesting. Well, if you're there, Mr. The, Stanger, you, you, you blocked me when I tried to ask you about, about some of your activities. I mean, if I were him, what yeah. I'd do is I wouldn't call myself um, Stanger on uh, when I named myself for Zoom, I, I'd rename myself as it, something it like might be somebody taking the eight, eight first. I'd put on it if I was Stanger. Yeah, eight maybe first. Zoom skills aren't that great, but um, you know he was welcomed back into the party by one of the leading right wingers on the uh, on the national executive, who, as it happened, was also the uh, chair of the disputes panel, which would have been in charge of uh, the process of you know disciplinary process against him. And that disciplinary process didn't come to any conclusion. It just vanished, um, which, you know, to me is very fishy. Uh, and then you suddenly got uh, right wingers welcoming him back to the party and saying how great it is to have him back in the party where he belongs, yeah. out campaigning with everybody and all this kind of stuff. So, you know, there is a pattern here, which none of, you know, won't surprise anybody, I don't think, but the level to which the evidence is coming out is, is interesting, uh, where okay. right wingers can... You know, I think in America they have a, state, a phrase, don't they? It's okay if it's a Republican. So, you know, basically, if a right winger does something, get away with it. As soon as a left winger even breathes in the wrong direction, then, uh, you know, they, they, they land on like a ton of bricks. And, well, that, uh, that, you know, that's that. If he's doing this, you know, that's the big question. If he's doing this now, what's Keir Starmer going to be like when he's actually in, you know, if he actually gets into power and has all the machinery of, uh, of state at his command, what's it going to be like then? That's the frightening thing. 